These regenerative care workshops are about exploring and discussing this concept of the regenerative cow. What type of cow is the regenerative cow? Who is she? And if we cast our minds back to the last round of workshops, we discussed a series of regenerative farming principles. We looked at rotational grazing and the cow's ability to graze the whole farm. We looked at species diversity and a cow that's able to utilise more than just a ryegrass ward as far as looking at introducing full herbal lays. So what today is about is having a look at the attributes of that regenerative cow and how she can thrive within the regenerative farming system for production and most importantly for high welfare. So, what's up for consideration today is your breeding policy within the next five to ten years. And the regenerative cow within your system is likely to be adapting and changing as you make changes on the farm. So if we have a look at the board now, you will see that there are lots of different types of regenerative cow. And what we're trying to say is that any type and any breed has the ability to be a regenerative cow. We talk about it being the right cow to suit your system and to suit your environment. The environment being South West Wales and the micro environment here being this farm. And we know that no two cows and no two farms are the same. Farms with drought environments compared to farms with moist environments, farms with permanent pasture compared to cropping farms, for example, farms with no funds compared to farms with extensive funds. We talk about farming regeneratively for your environment. But each farmer is likely to be looking to come to the same goal and the same outcome. And here are the five principles that we think applies to the regenerative cow and real take home messages for you today. Number one, a cow that can walk out to pasture, does she have the feet, the legs, the conformation to take those steps? We know from our Innova SRUC project that cows that are housed do a lot less steps to those that rotationally graze the whole farm. Some may take that even further and say that a cow needs to be able to maintain body condition from less purchased feed. Number two, is the cow robust enough? Is she hardy enough to withstand variable weather conditions as we look to elongate the grazing system? And number three, the cow's stability within the herd. Does she stay in the herd longer than you would expect? And some may say a cow should be treated like an employee. If she isn't productive, if she doesn't turn up for work, she gets replaced with another employee, another cow. And with that comes financial implications and grazing pressures, for example. Number four. There is a concept that if the regenerative cow requires minimal interventions and not a lot of medication throughout her lifetime, she is already suited and adapted to your environment. Number five, not only does the regenerative cow need to be able to calve down without assistance, but can she produce a viable, healthy calf that thrives within the beef or dairy supply chain every year? Now those cows are in your herd. You know that you have those cows within your herd. And they're more likely the invisible ones. They're the ones that just get on with it. You don't really know they're there. Now as you go around the stations today, hopefully we've found the tools to be able to equip you to select and manage these regenerative cows. For example, you may be looking to produce a cow less susceptible to lameness, mastitis and parasites, for example. So that's what the regenerative cow is. But what isn't she? And what she isn't likely to be is extreme in one trait. She's more than likely going to be normal or optimal across multiple traits. So as you listen to the specialist today, be honest with yourself and have a think about those regenerative cows within your herd and the tools that you can apply to help you select and manage these cows.
I'm Richard Dewhurst. I head the Dairy Research and Innovation Centre for SOUC, Scotland's Rural College based in Dumfries in southwest Scotland. We're working together with First Milk and a number of other industry and civic partners on a new £20 million project, Digital Dairy Value Chain for Southwest Scotland and Cumbria. It's part of the Strength in Places programme, which UK government is funding research and innovation projects designed to strengthen activity to improve growth and productivity in particular regions of the country. Dairying is a really important industry in that part of the world. It's a pretty sparse rural area, so dairying is very important. My name is Holly Ferguson. I'm a precision dairying scientist based at SRUC at Scotland Rural College, the Dairy Research and Innovation Centre in Dumfries. The Dairy Centre's project looked to try and use technologies already on farm, so technologies used for management of technical aspects like estrus detection, and put the information gathered from sensors together with manually recorded information to see what we can understand about cow welfare, with the goal being trying to create a, a verifiable index of cow welfare on farm to give consumers that reassurance of cow welfare. The manually recorded information that we collected on farm was what's called a QBA, so Qualitative Behavioural Analysis, which basically means looking at not what an animal is doing, but how it's doing it. So a nice example is two cows in front of you, one swinging her tail in a relaxed manner to dislodge flies, versus another swinging her tail in a very agitated manner. They're both doing the same thing, but in very different ways. So it's really about looking at the cows and trying to create a kind of understanding of the different behaviours that they're expressing. So things like agitation, frustration, calmness, happiness, and looking at a whole range of different behaviours. And then relating that back to the sensor information. So information collected from rumination and eating, information collected from activity, and information from lying times. Dairy Sensors was a feasibility study, a pilot study funded by Innovate UK with partners including SRUC, University of Strathclyde and First Milk. We worked with First Milk and Nestle farmers going out on farm, collecting information from their cows on behaviour and collecting information from sensors, be that collars, pedometers, a whole range of different sensor technologies. The results of the feasibility study thus far are indicating to us that the animals are showing what's called higher levels of herd synchrony when they're at pasture. We're seeing the animals behaving in a more similar way at pasture than when they're indoors and we're seeing animals exhibiting more positive behaviours, so more things like playfulness, liveliness, happiness and calm behaviours versus the more negative behaviours like frustration or boredom. And we're seeing the animals grouping closer together, both in terms of their behaviours and in terms of their sensor data. So closer lying times, changes in activity and changes in rumination and eating that the herd are all showing together. And we know that herd synchrony is a verifiable way of looking at positive welfare in animals. So going forward, it's something we'd like to explore more, collect more data from more farms and see if this is a way of us being able to use sensor data to have a verifiable, automatic way of looking at animal welfare on farm. One of the things that the project has shown us thus far is that basic things like cow comfort, so your cubicle sizes, your mattresses, your scraper passage width, and things like um, your stockman's attitude have made a huge difference to the animal behaviour. If we visited a farm where the stock person is very loud, very noisy working with the animals, it reflects in the behaviours. We tend to see more negative behaviours, so more frustration. Eh, the animals are a lot more nervous, whereas if you're working with your animals in a very calm, relaxed manner, it reflects on how the animals behave. We see more of these positive behaviours, so more playfulness, more relaxed, calm behaviours coming through in the animals. So whilst this project has given us an indication that sensor technologies might be able to give us an automatic way of looking at cow welfare and an aspect of cow happiness on farm, going forward we're looking to collect more data from more sensors, 
more sensor types and different types of farms. So going back to visit different systems, be that robotic systems, entirely pasture-based systems, or visiting farms at different points throughout the year to see how the cow behaviour changes and how that's reflected in the sensor data that we can collect. I think the, the main takeaway from the project at the moment is really that think about the basics, think about your cow comfort, your mattress quality, your cubicle size and remember that your happy cow is a healthy cow, is a productive cow and that's what you're looking for on farm. Hi, I'm Richard Miller. I'm Genomics Business Manager for National Milk Records. And I'm here to talk today about a small project I've done with First Milk involving NMR, a new technology we've brought into the company, and also how this fits with the whole message of regenerative agriculture. So genomics testing has been well established in the UK now. It's been available since 2010 on females. And the numbers are growing every year. And this shouldn't surprise us. The value proposition for most herds is very high and it's grown a lot in the last few years with the increased use of sex semen the percentage of the herd that needs to be bred pure is now much smaller than it's ever been which gives a much greater opportunity to select much better herd mothers than we've previously been able to of course the biggest challenge around this is the best genetics lives in the young stock shed but it's not all of them. So a genomics test allows you to identify the heifers that are good enough to breed to pure to dairy replacement and the ones that should go to beef, enabling those optimal future herd replacements that we all need. And so genomics is well established as a, as a service on farm. The service that NMR have brought in now builds on that same service but adds a lifetime of value to that test. And this service is called Genocells. And the idea behind genus cells is quite simple. If all of the cows that contribute to a bulk tank in a milking have been genotyped, we can actually get a somatic cell count for all the animals that contributed to the tank from a single bulk sample. And this is fairly revolutionary because up until now, it's required infrastructure to sample, it's required labor to sample, build up, build down times, and generally can only be done on a fairly inflexible routine. So we think this is really gonna change the market. Of course, the big win of it is it also ties in with that same single test that you've done to get all that genetic information and gives a lifetime of value on that test. First Milk were really interested with this because it fitted with their regenerative agriculture message. So two years ago, I was working with Tony Bruce. She said it'd be really interesting to run a project with First Milk Farms. So about a year ago, we consigned six farms for this project, two in Scotland, 450 herd in Cumbria, three south of the border, with the aim of actually just verifying for First Milk's management that this was a relevant way of getting cell counts for the herd. So we're just nearly a year into that project now. And what we did, we had four recorded herds and two non-recorded. The idea of the four recorded herds were to work as controls. So what we did was on the standard recording day, we would take the no normal milk samples from the individual cows, but we also took a bulk sample. This has allowed us to compile results between the two groups just to see how a traditional recording of cell counts stood up with a, with a genus cells based cell count. And the results have been very impressive. This is a snapshot of one set of results. We can see the correlation here between the genus cells cell count and the uh, traditional recording cell count along with the individual scores here. One of the most intriguing elements has been that with our German partners, LKV, who've done a lot more research in terms of how the two compare, their belief is that the genus cell cell count is actually more reliable because if we think of a traditional recording, there's all sorts of factors that can affect the accuracy. So you've got very fast milkings, you've got recorders under pressure to take samples, dirty freeze brands, sometimes scanning gates with RFID that get confused, and sometimes the sampling equipment on farm isn't brilliant. Whereas if we think about a DNA test, we know the results attributed to the cow as a fair few paternity cases globally would show. 
So we did this for four months. I compiled the results sent over to Tony. She compared the results of the traditional with the genus cell cell count. And first milk are comfortable that this is a valid way for us to get somatic cell counts for all the cows in the herd. So here's a summary slide. So what we can see in terms of the service, we've got that one-off tissue sample, which drives all of this important breeding information, whether that's the indexes, the UK PLI, SCI, ACI, or dairy wellness profit, parentage validation, but then coming into these really important parts of building these resilient animals. So production, milk and composition, efficiency, feed advantage, resilience, longevity, fertility, all the elements that drive a successful cow in the herd, and really these all important health traits in terms of our regenerative agriculture. But of course, if we head south of that tissue sample, incorporate it with this bulk sample, it drives these new somatic cell count management services from a single bulk sample, giving us that um, all important subclinical mastitis management, selective dry cow therapy, and also bulk payment testing where required. So it's a really intriguing service. In terms of its introduction into the UK, they'll be coming in from late autumn 2022. The initial services will be really basic, targeting non-recorded farms with genetic information based on the tissue sample and somatic cell counts. As we move into 2023, we move into what I believe are the most attractive service, and these will be hybrid. So four traditional recordings in a year, allowing you to complete your yonis management, neospora management, complete compositional records to your animals and keep your data up together, and then eight really easy months in between, or 20 if you want to do it fortnightly, just to give you that high-value cell count information on a very simple basis. So the key take-home points from me now are that genomics is here with us now. It's a really important part of our business is going forward. Numbers in the UK show 50% year-on-year growth, so dairy farmers completely get this technology. We know we're moving towards this, but now we're introducing services that will continue to build on that same test with a lifetime of value, simplifying farm management and giving us really good future services. Hi, I'm Claire Whittle. I'm a farm vet and I work in the Cheshire Shropshire Borders. I also moonlight um, as a vet for a little group called Dung Beetles for Farmers. So any of the information that I'm going to talk to you guys about today, if you want to have a little look online at dungbeetlesforfarmers.co.uk, there's a lot more information on there which is available for you to look at. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit first about dung beetles and why they're so important to us, particularly in our farming environments. And they are incredible ecosystem engineers. So we actually have two types of dung beetles in the UK. We have dwellers and we have tunnelers. So the dwellers do exactly that. They spend their entire life cycle within the pat or just below it. And they're really important because they actually suck the liquid portion out of the dung. And in doing so, they dry that pat out so they can increase our pasture availability, our forage availability, if you like. And then they also reduce the available habitat for our pest um, creatures to be able to complete their life cycles. So our parasitic worms and our pest flies that are a nuisance in our cattle, if they have really dry poo, they're going to be unable to complete their life cycles. Um, and then we also have our tunnelling species. So these are the big guys, which you can see up here on the screen. Um, and these are our geotrupids. And these guys are super cool. So they're one of the biggest beetles that we actually have in the UK. And their job is actually to tunnel down underneath the pat. So they take our poo from the top of our pasture, they pull it down into the earth, and then the dung beetles actually lay their eggs inside brood balls underneath the ground. So if we're talking about like carbon sequestration, for example, we want that all that lovely poo under the ground where it can be stored and where we can get some more nutrient cycling going. Dung beetles are actually really important when we talk about farm biodiversity, particularly when we're facing such a huge biodiversity loss. Now, not just dung beetles, but a whole host of other insects actually live inside our pats. So the argument is if a single pat holds a thousand insects, then how great are cows in our landscape? They're also very important prey species for lots of other creatures. So wading birds really rely on our dung and you'll often see holes in them in your fields. And that's usually birds digging through your pats looking for beetles and larvae and various other things in there as well. 
Dung beetles are also really detrimentally affected by some of the practices we employ in agriculture. One of those things would be worming our cattle and potentially even worming our cattle too frequently. So what are the ways we can help dung beetles on our farms? And one of those is by doing faecal egg counts to try and reduce our wormer usage. Faecal egg counting is also really important because not only is it for dung beetles, but also we're facing more and more antelmintic or wormer resistance in our livestock. So protecting the wormers that we have and using them only when necessary is really important. So trying to use as little as possible uh, will definitely help those dung beetles and also reduce the risk of you suffering with wormer resistance on your farm. So in terms of how to get the best faecal egg count, the first thing is hygiene. So you'll notice that I'm wearing gloves today. You don't want to be digging around in muck because there's lots of things in muck that we can get that we really, really don't want. So timing of faecal egg counts is really important. And I would tend to start faecal egg counting about four to six weeks post turnout. Now, the reason for that is our gut worm life cycle is usually about 21 days. So if you take a sample about two weeks after turnout, you're potentially going to get a falsely negative result as it takes a full three weeks to get through the animal and come out of its back end. So four to six weeks post turnout, best time to start. And then you really need to repeat them throughout the season. So again, repeating them every four to six weeks is really important to give us an overview of what's going on in your animals over time. The other thing that's really important is the number. So in terms of the number of samples that you're collecting should be representative of the number of animals in the group. So ideally a minimum of 10 samples from each management group. The reason we have to get samples from each management group is because even if you have the same animals in, e in two different fields, it's possible that the pasture in one field was managed differently the previous year. So you want samples from each management group. The samples should be as fresh as possible. So ideally they want to be collected as the animals pass muck. So a really good time to take them is often when you go in the field in the morning, all the animals stand up and usually the first thing they do is drop a load of muck onto pasture. So that's a really good time to take them. I would collect them individually as well. So these pots are really useful for collecting samples um, and we will pull them for you either at the vets or they will do that for you at the lab. But try to collect them individually because we need such a small amount per animal that collecting a lot in one go is not very useful. So about 40 grams per animal is enough. Um, and one of these pots is great because they're about the right size if you, you need to fill them up to the top. And the other thing you really want to do is make sure you expel as much air from it as possible. And that just keeps it really, really fresh. Now, the reason we need the samples fresh is because as once your poo has landed on the pasture, the eggs start to hatch out into worms. And then again, we can get a falsely negative result. So we want to catch the eggs. So getting these as fresh as possible, pick them up off the pasture, get them straight to us is really, is really useful. Samples should be examined as soon as possible, or they can be kept in the fridge a couple of days, which halts the life cycle, but really get them to us as soon as you can. You can send them directly to the labs yourself as well. Um, and again, just make sure they're well packaged, speak to your vet about how to package them up. And if you are going to be doing them yourself, just make sure you do some quality control. So at the start of every season, I always send my first couple of samples away to the lab just to make sure my counts match up with what their counts are saying. I would never use worm egg counts in isolation. So whenever I go out to take samples, I'm looking at the whole group of animals. So I'll look at things like body condition score. I'll maybe body condition score 10 animals. I'll also look at the percentage of mucky bums, how many animals have got loose muck, whether any of them are coughing, and those things will play into whether or not I choose to worm those animals or not. And I'm comparing them to the last time that I saw them every single time I do it. So the other reason why using less wormers is really important is that wormer resistance is becoming an increasing problem. We've seen it increasing in sheep over the years and we're starting to see more in cattle. Wormer resistance is the loss of sensitivity to a drug in a worm population that was previously sensitive to that drug and that can build up over time. When we use wormers regularly without testing and if they don't need to be used then we're increasing the risk of wormer resistance. So every single time that you worm there is a population of resistant worms that is left inside that animal. So we want to reduce our use where possible. Another thing that increases the risk of wormer resistance is dosing and moving. So we used to historically say we would dose our animals and then we put them straight onto clean pasture. Nowadays, what we realise is that if we do that, if we dose them and they immediately go onto clean pasture, the only worms that end up hitting that pasture are the resistant worms that have survived the treatment. Ideally, what we'd like to do is leave the animals on dirty pasture for a couple of days to drop all those resistant worms and then they can breed with the sensitive worms on the pasture. 
Underdosing is another way um, we can increase the risk of resistance in our cattle. So always dosing for the right weight is really important and also checking the calibration of your dosing guns every single time that you use them. So if it says it's dosing 10 mil, empty that out into a bowl, suck it up with a syringe and see if it is actually dosing 10 mil because underdosing is a real risk of increasing your, your worm resistance on the farm. Do you need to worm all the animals on your farm? So if you could pick the top 10 or 20 percent that are growing really well, chances are they don't have a worm problem. And also adult animals really don't necessarily need to be wormed. If they've had at least two grazing seasons on your farm, chances are they've built up some resilience to the wormers and uh, they, will, they will not need to be wormed. Animals actually need to come in contact with some worms in order to build their own immunity. So that's really important when we're thinking about wormer use and particularly when we're using things like lungworm vaccination, which works by the animals receiving the vaccination and then actually having some exposure to lungworm on the pasture. So having discussions with your vet is very, very important when it comes to parasite control on your farm. Thank you all very much for coming. The workshops that we're doing this week mark the end of an 18-month project with Innovate UK funding. Um, so on the sensor technology that you heard about with SIUC um, down at their station with that Innovate funding was very much appreciated. And we worked with three sensor companies that are here today. We've got Allflex, Affy Milk and Cowalert Ice Robotics. So, um, so please feel free to speak to them. Um, they are here to see what information you can tap into and hopefully you found it all interesting. And also we'd like to thank Hugh and Gethi Ayer for hosting us today. Very much appreciated. It's been, uh, been a great day and thank you for organising the weather as well.